present and future. Let's get started. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and good morning for everyone calling in from the central and western part of the country. My name is Jim Scanlon. I'm the head of relationship management here at the firm. I'd like to welcome you to the April installment of our monthly strategy and market outlook. Q1, tumultuous as it was at times, is in the books, uh, but uncertainty amongst investors is clearly at a very high level. As we've said many times before, our goal here is to make this webinar as helpful and informative as possible and to do so in a timely manner. As we know, everyone is very busy, so let's get right to it. I'm joined as always by our head of research and co-portfolio manager, Jim Warner, who will share his thoughts and walk us through the changing landscape and how we're positioned to both face challenges and take advantage of opportunities. Before I turn it over to Jim, just a reminder that we welcome and encourage your question. Questions are anonymous, and so please uh, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any time during the presentation, and we'll get to those at the end of the meeting. With that, Jim, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Jim. Let me uh, share my screen here. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> thank you, Jim, um, and thank you all for uh, participating. This is um, you know, a great opportunity to um, share with you our thoughts. Um, and so I wanna cover a couple of top, a few topics today. Um, first, I wanna address uh, the banking turmoil of the last few weeks. As someone who has spent his entire career investing in banks all over the world and lived through a few financial crises, uh, I wanna pass along some of my insights. Um, I hope that you had a chance to read the two research pieces I published during uh, last month. As you know, having uh, worked with us uh, during the pandemic, we are committed to keeping you informed about the market, especially during crises. Uh, second, I'm going to address why Silicon Valley Bank was dissolved, what happened, and most importantly, why I don't believe this is a system-wide crisis. And lastly, I'll address the markets, uh, some unusual lopsidedness in performance, uh, how that and how that impacts our portfolio positioning. So uh, no further ado, let's jump into the presentation, which I have entitled Banking Crisis Averted, But Economic Questions Increase. So before I go any further, um, we custody our clients' assets with Charles Schwab. And let me reiterate uh, to the message that I provided a few weeks ago that your money and your client's money is safe at Charles Schwab. I wrote about this in a report last month, but it bears repeating. All client securities are segregated and custodied at safe third-party institutions like the Depository Trust Company or the Bank of New York. This includes money market funds. The only asset remotely at risk is cash held at Schwab's bank. This is insured up to the FDIC limit of $250,000. Even though we believe the Schwab Bank is safe, we proactively move all client excess cash into money market funds just to be on the safe side. And I'm happy to take additional questions at the end about this. The other important headline to not vary is that the current banking turmoil is not like 2008. 2008 was a credit-induced crisis. The $1 trillion of mortgages that were made to people who couldn't afford them, that was 2008. That is not what is going on today. As far as the U.S. regional bank turmoil is concerned, the issue is all about interest rate risk management. I'll spend a few minutes on what exactly happened to Silicon uh, Valley Bank, but in short, they grossly mismanaged their interest rate exposure last year as the Fed raised interest rates from 0% to nearly 5%, the fastest and largest amount since the early 80s. So while all banks faced this problem of higher interest rates, only a few individual banks got it wrong, which means there won't be a domino effect. And with the Fed's new liquidity facility, uh, the bank term lending program, this, this issue is essentially over. And we can tell that by looking at the bank funding market and deposit flows, which are quieting down and returning to normal. Credit Suisse is an entirely different and idiosyncratic story of decades of mismanagement. 
Every year, they found a way to lose billions of dollars on stupid trades, corrupt clients, and other manners, reflecting terrible risk management. This was a slow motion business failure with no read across to the rest of the industry. That said, when any globally systemic bank is on the brink of extinction, very bad things can happen like asset fire sales. But thanks to the swift actions of the Swiss regulators and UBS, that issue has uh, been put to rest. To understand why Silicon Valley Bank failed, you need to understand how unique their business was. If we look at their balance sheet, a couple of unusual things pop out. First, securities, there you go. Uh, securities made up nearly 60% of their assets, among the highest of any regional bank. Uh, these, were, these securities were in safe uh, securities like treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. But what did we learn about even safe bonds last year? They can lose a lot of value prior to being made whole upon maturity. Second, their, uh, their loan book was also chock full of loans to startups and venture-backed companies in Silicon Valley. These aren't the safest of loans. And third, nearly all of their funding was from deposits and not just any old depositors. These were savvy venture capitalists that also controlled uh, the purse strings of the companies that they backed. And finally, uh, a bank's loss cushion, uh, which is the shareholder's equity here in the bottom right, um, wasn't ultimately adequate to quell concerns about the losses that were building in the securities and loan books. So I'm not gonna go in depth uh, through this particular slide, but this slide depicts essentially where the cash comes into a bank and leaves the bank. Um, and a run on the bank scenario, which is what happened to Silicon Valley, it's when too many deposits leave and the bank doesn't have access to enough cash to satisfy that. Essentially, depositors realized that uh, the bank was stuck. Silicon Valley couldn't sell securities to fund withdrawals without incurring massive losses because that would have, and that would, that would obliterate their capital base or the loss cushion I just pointed out. Um, now they could turn to the Federal Home Loan Bank or even the Fed window, but before they could uh, you know, hit those lenders of last resort uh, sufficiently, uh, depositors pulled out about a quarter of all of the deposits in the bank and the run was on. And uh, to the FDIC, that enough was enough. What this event reminds us is the, is of the uniqueness of bank business models. Banks can't pay all of their deposit requests if too many customers show up at the same time and ask for their deposits all at once. That's true for all banks. Those deposits have been lent out or used to buy securities. So it's essential that a bank has earned the confidence of its depositors. No depositor confidence means no bank. Beyond the first $250,000 of an account's balance, there is no insurance so that the money is only as safe as the answer to two very important questions. One, does the bank have sufficient capital? In other words, can they absorb potential losses from their loan and securities book? Um, and two, does the bank have sufficient liquidity to meet any anticipated deposit withdrawal demands? So this bank business model is nothing new. And the challenge banks have faced over the last year is to manage the losses in their securities books as interest rates increase. Remember, when interest rates increase, the value of a bond declines. And Silicon Valley did a really bad job of managing this risk. Ultimately, Silicon Valley, Valley got overly aggressive buying very long dated treasuries and mortgage backed securities. Remember how we warned about owning long duration bonds in 2021 and most of 2022? This is why. Silicon Valley incurred losses greater than their capital base and that scared its depositors. This long duration bond portfolio created another problem. It was crushing their profitability as the interest income coming off this portfolio was fixed while their liabilities, i.e. their deposits, were repricing with higher short-term interest rates. That's a very ugly situation and one that couldn't be fixed. Uh, Silicon Valley also had a very unique depositor base, as I alluded to earlier. They had a very, they have very sophisticated venture capitalists for depositors um, that also controlled the purse strings at their portfolio companies. 
And this created a very uniquely concentrated number of depositors that wielded disproportionate leverage over many of the deposits. So not, and not surprisingly, First Republic Bank and PacWest, who have similar business models, have also come under attack. But you can't say the same thing for any other bank in the country. So this turmoil really seems fairly isolated and idiosyncratic. All right, so what does this all mean? Well, while the panic seems to be contained and calming down, that doesn't mean that the banking industry isn't going to see challenges. Clearly managing interest rate risk remains a priority, but there are growing credit concerns surrounding commercial real estate loans and loans to startup companies. We believe the, uh, that the combination of these factors is likely to force banks to tighten their lending standards, and that could have a negative impact on economic growth. On, this, uh, on the margin, this increases the chance of a deeper recession in our view. Long-term, we think banks will face more regulations and we will have to wait and see what sort of an impact that will have on, on the bank uh, profitability and their willingness to lend. <clears throat> By now, you know that we have been talking about rolling recessions in the economy since early last year. First, it was housing as interest rates increased. Next was consumer goods as consumers shifted back, uh, their, their spending back to services. Then the bubble popped in tech land. Energy hit the skids uh, you know, later in the year as commodity prices collapsed, and finally banking. When banks have a tough time, it's a, it's a bit like the tide going out for all boats. So all of these recessions could be deeper and longer bef uh, before we see a recovery. And that ultimately could spread into um, services. But now for the good news, the labor market remains very strong, and this is supporting strong consumer spending. Now this could all change, but given the decline uh, in inflation, there is no evidence of an imminent decline. So this keeps us modestly optimistic that the overall economy could pull through after another slug sluggish year or two. Um, in fact, if you're ready for more good news, um, if we take a look at the services PMI, we can even see an acceleration in growth. So the, so the jury is still out. So far, so good, but time will tell. Um, but I show this data point as well as the labor data as evidence against being overly pessimistic about the path of the economy. In spite of the uh, concerns over the economy and the banking system, the S&P 500 finished March up 7.5% for the year. We've talked a lot about the market's valuation previously, and it's still elevated at 18 times forward earnings, which is a little concerning, particularly if the economy worsens and corporate earnings uh, estimates need to be revised lower. That said, the devil is always in the details. Um, I stripped out just six stocks from the S&P 500 index, Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, Nvidia, and Meta. And as you can see from the table, these stocks have driven virtually all of the index's performance. The other interesting piece of this analysis is that these six tech stocks trade at a whopping 25 times PE, whereas the rest of the S&P is trading at a more digestible 16 times. And in fact, because many of these companies are experiencing businesses, business downturns already, their earnings estimates in many cases have already been reduced sufficiently. One other point I'll make is that the six tech stocks um, are up collectively 29% year to date, uh, but they were down a collective 38% last year. If you will recall, we were underweight technology all last year and beginning late uh, last fall, we began gradually adding exposure, uh, technology exposure to get to our current overweight exposure today. I mention this because this is a good example of how we tactically steer the portfolio. So one thing powering up technology shares is lower interest rates. The banking turmoil and its impact on economic growth expectations caused interest rate expectations to plummet over the last few weeks. The line on the graph is where rate expectations were a month ago on our last call. And the solid area is where they are today. You see how much lower they are. The market currently expects the Fed to stop hiking rates and will pivot to cutting rates later this year. In fact, the market expects 100 basis points of cuts by next January. The, um, this pivot uh, has supported our thesis of sifting through the technology rubble 
uh, that we talked about last month um, and, uh, and previously before that. So let's get into the portfolio. When we, so when we think about uh, the investment portfolio and all of the models that we manage, I think it's important to take a step back and recognize that this is a tricky investing environment. Um, the, uh, let me just go back here one second. The um, high levels of volatility for both stocks and bonds has created various landmines. Thankfully, we have avoided. Um, last year, we missed most of the carnage from the technology landmine and that of long duration bonds. This year so far, we've avoided the banking landmine with little damage. These landmines were portfolio killers and each created catastrophic losses, the types of, the types of which can take a decade or more uh, to recover from. We attribute our ability to miss these landmines to our risk management mindset, which is governed by a simple principle. The best way to grow well is to avoid catastrophic losses. By avoiding ca catastrophic losses, you can allow compounding to do its work to meet wealth goals over the long term. So from a portfolio positioning standpoint, we remain pretty conservative. We're at the low end of, the, uh, of our risk tolerance ranges for all strategies. Our recent addition of beaten up growth stocks has worked extremely well. Um, and our caution in the direction of the economy has us still though pretty conservative on having uh, much in the way of cyclical exposure. Our goal position has served really uh, served its role very well as a volatility, volatility hedge last month. And our high quality fixed income positions have provided welcome yield and portfolio stability. While we have some concern over the direction of the market, there are lots of opportunities within it. And to just to uh, highlight a couple of recent trades, um, you know, to that end, we've, we've done some rebalancing uh, trades in both our flagship global vigilance product as well as our strategic income product. Um, and as you can see here, we took the opportunity to trim one of our big winners from last year, which is Merck, and upsize several positions that have um, that were A, undersized, and B, have underperformed, which includes Expedia, uh, the biotechnology ETF, IBB, and Darling, which is a, um, a maker of um, biodiesel and uh, collagen products and other products that are made from uh, used cooking oil and animal fats. Um, we also entered a brand new position in public storage. Uh, you know, as you probably know, this is a leading provider of self storage solutions in the United States. Uh, they avoided doing a very dumb acquisition in our view, um, which was announced yesterday. And uh, this is just a terrific business that we've been watching for years. Uh, we've got, and always found it to be uh, overvalued, um, but the, it sort of got caught up recently in the financials pullback. And so we were um, able to afford um, the opportunity to get in. Um, and the other thing I've mentioned is that we're not chasing this technology run up. And actually, before we um, take questions, I do want to share one other thing. I've got some uh, you know, market data here in the back, but it's really pretty wild if we look at what happened last month. Um, technology was up almost 11% as a sector. Financials were down 10%. And then essentially all of the other sectors were had fairly muted performances, whether they were defensive or cyclical. Which is um, which is sort of an odd thing, but you can see obviously uh, quarter to date or, or which is actually a year to date, not figure. Technology has been the uh, the huge outperformer um, after being the big underperformer last year. So maybe with that, uh, let's take some questions, Jim. Okay, great, Jim. Thank you. We have a question here. It says, can you help reconcile the quote, weaker than expected jobs data with what was supposed to be good news to quell inflation? So I think they're referring to the ADP data this morning. Um, yeah, so the market is hoping for weaker jobs data. Um, and it's not because they're wishing for a um, you know an economic recession. They just want the Fed to have fewer reasons to continue raising interest rates. And so, um, you know, so that's that's part of it. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I think what, how the market is actually reacting to that today, uh, there's a bunch of other factors going on, but if you can just, what it, what essentially this says to me, and, and by the way, not a lot of people put a lot of stead in the ADP number. You know, we really need to see payrolls this Friday. Um, 
Uh, and that's the, the number that's going to matter more. But we can see from like, for example, the unemployment claims data that there has just been this very slow creep um, in terms of normalization uh, back to still very strong levels in the labor market. Um, and that's good in terms of creating enough slack so that uh, wages don't continue to increase and drive inflation up. But, you know, taking a step back, um, you know, all of the, a lot of the other components of inflation are really showing uh, pretty serious signs of disinflation. And so, you know, we're pretty confident that inflation is headed in the right direction, which is of course down. And um, any sort of weak labor reports, so long as they're not super weak, um, should, should obviously uh, encourage that trend. Great, Jim. Uh, that is actually all the questions we have in the queue at this time. Okay. Anyone else wants to offer up a question here in the final moments? By all means, please. Uh, happy to take those. As we wait to see if there's any final questions coming in, Jim, is there a, a final comment or two you want to share? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that we're spending a lot of time on is thinking about when to get more aggressive. As I mentioned, all of our portfolios are are fairly conservatively positioned. Um, and we're happy hanging out in really high quality fixed income at this point. Um, there's just too many uncertainties. One of the things, for example, that we're watching closely is to the extent that banks do really pull back on their, on their lending, because that will have a direct impact on economic growth. Um, I've seen estimates that range anywhere, you know, that, that talk about less than 1% impact on GDP. Um, I think it's really hard to, to, to figure out exactly what that is. Um, but be between essentially just general conservatism, um, not locking up uh, cash in loans, and then um, I think the uh, possible, you know, there's a lot of talk obviously about credit losses uh, potentially building up in commercial real estate loan books. Um, I just feel like uh, the banks are going to be more cautious here. And so we're going to be generally cautious to see what that impact has on the economy broadly. But that being said, um, as I alluded to in my comments, we are seeing lots of opportunities. We are seeing great businesses that have um, whose, num which num whose numbers we actually really believe in uh, trading at incredibly low valuations. And so um, this is not a time to just sit still. Uh, we are uh, spending time you know, kind of sifting through the rubble to use the term that I, I used last month um, and trying to pick out the stuff that's just getting thrown out. Um, but, you know, one area where we, we aren't, uh, you know, adding risk to is, is banks specifically. Um, I, I'd, I'd point that out. Um, looks like we got one more question. Um, I'm still looking at the 14 times PE levels and entry point. Yeah, I mean, historically, that has been one uh, measure that, gives you some assurance that the market is near a bottom. Um, now, the way that's typically measured though, is on essentially the peak um, the peak uh, earnings figures. So before earnings essentially start getting revised down, if you can, if the market trades to 14 times, even those inflated numbers, that's usually a good sign for a market bottom. It turns out that if you go, if you think back to uh, the slide that I had where I, I pulled out the six tech stocks, um, large cap tech stocks out of the S&P 500. The rest of the S&P right now is trading at around 16 times. And there are many stocks in there that are, that are tr trading much, much lower than that. Um, to me, I feel a lot better right now owning the rest of the S&P, as it were, as opposed to those big large cap tech stocks, at least over the short term. Um, but I think it's going to be very interesting uh, to see where earnings estimates go. This, you know, we're about to head into uh, the Q1 earnings season. And I think there is, uh, you know, the Q4 earnings season wasn't super impressive, but it also wasn't a disaster. It was sort of better than feared. I think what you're going to find in Q1 is there are going to be some band-aids ripped off. And uh, that'll actually allow us to see the earnings really revise lower. So I think what we're doing now is, to, to kind of sum up this point is that we're really watching to see where the numbers bottom out, where the earnings numbers bottom out as opposed to just simply the PE, and then just be really specific and targeted at which stocks that we own. So all in all, um, you know, this is really more of a stock pickers market than just sort of buy the whole market. Um, I guess there's one other question. 
Are there other themes that you are looking at, but not currently invested in, and, and what would be the catalyst? Well, we're always looking at new themes. Um, we have, you know, we have essentially a big theme in clean energy, and we're always looking at offshoots from that. Um, particularly in, um, uh, we've we've entered into a travel-related trade, um, and that's been sort of a new a new theme that we've entered into. Um, we have been, you know, looking at uh, names that have basically gotten caught up in the banking turmoil, but aren't banks. And there's a number of names uh, that I won't share with you today, but uh, that we're looking at there that sort of just got caught up in the in the uh, in that sell-off. Um, although one of them uh, would be would be public storage that I uh, mentioned that we just entered into. So there are, um, you know, we're constantly developing new themes. Um, we are doing a lot of homework on Europe. Um, Europe, you know, skirted a economic crisis last year, um, and we're still doing a lot of work on that. And we're doing a lot of work on energy again. Um, we're spending a lot of time there. There is just not enough oil being produced for the demand, and uh, that's something that we think is a structural problem that could last a few years. So, um, and given just how cheap, particularly um, energy stocks are these days, that actually could be a big win. So, and I'd say lastly, we're, we're still sifting through the tech rubble. There's a lot of unbelievable companies that are, you know, down 80%, and uh, it's are definitely um, worth our time and a look. So let me, um, if there aren't any, many, any more questions, Jim, we can um, wrap up. Great. Well, as always, we appreciate you joining us here this month, and uh, we will be following up shortly with the recorded version of the presentation that can be shared with clients and colleagues alike. Um, as always, we're here to help in any way that we can. Should there be anything you can, uh, we can do to help you, um, please feel free to call upon any of us. Jim and Rick are always accessible, as are Keith, Tom, myself in the field. Um, we're grateful um, for the trust you've placed in us to manage your client irreplaceable wealth. And we look forward to chatting with you here in the second quarter. So thank you again very much and have a, a great afternoon. Thank you all. Take care.